I've said it before and I'll say it again. Horses have had it too good for too long. Just look at the world of video games, a genre that loves giving you, the player, a creature to ride around on to get where you're going faster. And what are the most famous, iconic and beloved mounts in all of gaming? That's right, horses. Despite the fact that there are so many other creatures out there that regularly prove more helpful and frankly much more hilarious than their equine counterparts. Step off, Epona, jog on, Agro, and tell Roach to go swivel, because today is all about the bizarre mounts in games that make horses look like garbage. No huge spoilers to watch for in this list, except you will see the very end of Bowser's Fury, so skip that one if you don't want to see if it's the one where Mario finally gets eaten by Bowser or not. Elephants are incredible creatures. Not only are these majestic beasts the world's largest land mammals, they're also extremely intelligent and are actually capable of communication via subtle vibrations in the ground. I wonder what this elephant is trying to communicate. Probably not something we can repeat. Family friendly channel and all. There's nothing too friendly about the elephants of Far Cry 4, but there are many things awesome about them. First and foremost, it's possible to ride them once you've unlocked the perk that makes that possible. For faster travel around the region of Karat than you could manage on foot. More importantly though, this most impressive and surprisingly maneuverable of video game mounts is an absolute killing machine. While astride the elephant's mighty back, it's still possible to shoot and perform melee attacks. Except a melee attack when you're in command of a four-ton elephant, well, it hits different. I'd like to see a horse do that. Actually, no, I wouldn't. With a faithful elephant under you, clearing out entire outposts full of enemies can become almost trivial. Even vehicles are no match for one of these beasts on a killing spree so relentlessly savage, it's little wonder that Carthaginian General Hannibal, upon first beholding an elephant, uttered the famous words, Holy heck fellas, we gotta get these bad boys across the Alps. Or something like that. I don't know, I forgot everything I learned in history class to make room for more Far Cry 4 elephant takedowns. <laughs> Worth it, as Caesar once spake. One thing horses aren't very good at is climbing, unless it's a horse in Skyrim. <laughs> ah, so graceful. But in the world of Middle-earth, there's another beast that has some verticality to its movement, and we mean perfectly vertical. Wandering around in shadow of Mordor are Caragors, great angry beasts who you don't want to get on the wrong side of. But you don't have to avoid them. Unlock the ride Caragors ability and you can land on these slavering, befanged pack hunters and bend them to your will. Or, even better, you can upgrade the ability again, so you just have to point Celebrimbor's bow towards a Caragor and mount it from what feels like miles away. <laughs> I'd like to see a horse put up with that wraith bull <laughs> Once you're on the beast, you'll soon discover why a Caragor is amazing for getting around. One, you can smash through orcs with ease. Two, you can use it to finish off orcs on the ground. And three, rather than limit your parkouring abilities, you can clamber up 90 degree inclines, meaning that no route is too difficult and no delicious orc is out of reach. Oh, you thought you were safe, Mr. Orc. Think again. That <laughs> never gets old. But those aren't the only great things about Caragors. While riding on one, you are safe from other Caragors, but if you're lucky enough to find a specially marked one next to a couple of its buddies, you can instantly get your own Caragor crew. Take that, horses! 
see these highlighted fiends are dire caragors, and if you take over one, its friends will automatically follow you around, helping you to tear to shreds anything in your sight. Which is great for large groups of orcs who are hoping not to be torn apart by three huge monsters with really big teeth. <laughs> Although, be warned, one very, very minor flaw is that your additional helpers do not distinguish good from bad, so they're not great to have around if you're trying to help out human prisoners. Bad Karagor! Put him down! No, wait, not like that! No one tell Gandalf about this. Mario has saddled up on many mounts in his time, some more iconic than others. For every Yoshi, there's a... big shoe. But we knew Mario was in safe hands when we learned that in Super Mario 3D World spin-off Bowser's Fury, Mario would be relying heavily on Plessy to navigate the open world Lake Lapcat Archipelago. <coughs> Plessy had already won our hearts in the core game, rideable occasionally in special levels and serving as a fine example of Nintendo character design at its most fun, because Plessy is adorable, wears a bandana, is pettable, and has occasionally been described by Nintendo as a dinosaur. <laughs> when of course, it's clearly based on a plesiosaur, which isn't a dinosaur at all. <laughs> Those jokers. In Bowser's Fury, Plessy is even more brilliant and makes surfing between the islands that make up the playable area about one million times more fun than travelling by warp pipe. Plessy has many other virtues that make this amphibious ally one of video games' greatest non-horse mounts, like how Plessy is primarily water-based but is just as happy on land, a change that lets Plessy use its powerful bulk to destroy basically anything it touches. Plessy is extremely fast and satisfying to control, and best of all, unlike some mounts we could mention, is somehow always right there when you need a ride. Nintendo loves Plessy so much it even gave it the killing blow on the final boss in Bowser's Fury, who, no points for guessing, is Bowser. Well, Fury Bowser anyway, which is the stadium-sized, corrupted form of Bowser that can only be fought by a kaiju of equal power, Mario, having powered up with a Giga Bell to become Giga Cat Mario, because I looked away for 10 seconds and in that time Mario became Dragon Ball Z, I guess. As the battle progresses, Mario ends up chasing Fury Bowser, now in possession of the Giga Bells, from atop, who else, Plessy which amazingly results in Plessy absorbing all three Giga Bells and becoming Giga Cat Plessy for the killing blow, which I bet Bowser didn't see coming. Mario is anime now, Bowser. Get with the program. I have one item available for purchase. It is far too expensive for it merely to be sold. You may gaze upon it and dream of the wealth required to possess it, as have lords and kings. And then you may leave and purchase things from shops more aligned with your station. Dragon Age Inquisition is a serious, complex RPG about the delicate balance of power within the war-torn region of Thedas. It also has little bald rabbits called nugs in it. The snuffling, hairless nugs can be found all over the game world and are either super cute or kind of creepy depending on whether or not you've noticed yet that they have little human hands. Ew. So you might be a little disappointed if, say, you decided to spend the shocking 10,000 gold required to purchase the mystery box. The only item sold by the equally mysterious merchant Darabohm in the city of Val Royo, only to find it contains, oh, a golden nug. Hmm. Maybe it could make a good paperweight? Wait, no. These little weird human hands will touch my papers. <laughs> Bin it. Hold on though, because interacting with the golden nug, presumably by trying to hoof it through a window, activates a quest. A quest that an NPC can finish for you in two hours, at the end of which you'll find in your stables, oh holy heck, what is that? It's a nuggalope, a super swole version of the humble nug that, oh yes, is now yours to ride. 
The Nuggalope is perhaps the most fun mount in all of Dragon Age, because it's roughly the size of a rhino, has enormous F-off horns, and while it still has human hands, they're no longer creepily small. Now they're big and stompy. Nuggalopes are also far tougher than the boring horses you may have been employing to get from A to B up to this point, able to withstand more punishment in battle than any other mount in the game before vanishing and leaving you to it. Nuggalope, I'll always treasure the time we had together. Did you ever see something in a video game that you loved so much you wished it could be real? Well, for me, that moment was in Pokemon Sun and Moon when it became apparent that one way of getting around was being carried by a Machamp that cradles you lovingly in its arms. Machamp is just one of several so-called ride Pokemon that serve as mounts in the Alola region. These highly trained Pokemon come to your aid whenever you need to get around fast or smash through a particular obstacle, and are summonable by Pager like an on-call doctor in the 90s. Charizard will fast travel you from spot to spot around the map, or on Terra Firma you've got Tauros or Stoutland or Mudsdale, while Lapras and Sharpedo ferry you quickly across Alola's aqueous regions. And that's all well and good, but again, none of these other methods of pokey conveyance sees you, the passenger, actually flopping casually around in the arms of a Machamp. Like your Pokemon trainer is a wealthy prince in medieval times with castlefuls of gold and eccentric whims and a Machamp employed as a fainting couch. To be fair, being carried by a Machamp isn't all that fast, and this ride Pokemon's main function is supposed to be using those other arms to push boulders out the way, but the good people at Game Freak accidentally made the carrying animation too hilarious, I guess, because we never want to get down. And if you ask us, the fact your character will always 100% of the time wear an extremely dorky safety helmet while being transported this way is the icing on the cake. As if they're enjoying the ride, but also a bit worried Machamp will smack their head on a door frame or something. It's the leading cause of death among Pokemon trainers. Probably. In most homes, the rule is don't put your feet on the coffee table. But what if you put your whole body on the coffee table? Checkmate, my friend's mum! Well, the answer to that question can be found in Mother 3, when Lucas and his pals stumble across this weird coffee table with a weird little extra nubbin on one end. Interact with it and you'll find that, whoa, that nubbin is actually some kind of head, and this coffee table is actually a mount. <laughs> And not just any mount, one that can fit Lucas and all his pals on, even of the canine kind, with ease. Plus, you don't need to feed it, and it's a good spot to display a nice art book or two. The coffee table has great speed, helping you to zip quickly through this long highway of tunnels. And the bonuses don't just end there. See, these roads are crawling with enemies, but the seemingly invincible coffee table can just smash its way through them, preventing you from getting held up in a bunch of extra turn-based battles. If you listen carefully, I think you can hear the screams of the players who didn't realise that the coffee table was a mount and ran the entire way. Yeah, there they are. Beautiful. It's such a great mount that Nintendo couldn't limit it to just one series. Indeed, when Lucas was added to Smash Brothers, his entrance into the fights was him riding into the stage on the trusty coffee table, much to the confusion of anyone who hadn't played Mother 3. Three, two, one, go! Although to be honest, I'm more confused as to why Lucas doesn't keep the invincible coffee table for the fight. I'd win so many more games that way! The appeal of Monster Hunter Rise is very straightforward. You can drive dinosaurs into each other. 
That's right, by bashing a house-sized scaly behemoth into a rideable state, the next thing you can do is hop atop its back and turn this majestic monster into a mode of transport. Next stop, this other majestic monster's stupid face. Simply brilliant. So imagine how confident we'd have to be to say there is an even better thing to ride in Monster Hunter Rise. Very confident is how confident. That's the Palamute for you though, a sort of magic fox greyhound hybrid that accompanies you on hunts and that can be mounted in a moment to rapidly and badassly close the distance between you and your prey. As well as going like the clappers, a Palamute can make the kind of jumps that would make any horse blush and unlike any horse we've ever met, is completely immune to fall damage. Amazing, and that's before you factor in that a Palamute can be drifted round corners like a rally car, sprint vertically, be dressed in all sorts of outlandish clothes, is fully customizable right down to its bark. And when you finally do dismount, not that you'll ever want to, it doesn't stand around eating hay or whatever, it puts a gigantic blade between its teeth and attacks. Show me a horse that can do that, and I'll probably hide from it. So those were some of the mounts that were just so much better than horses. I mean, like, horses are fine, but they're a bit basic. Come on, we want a Caragor. Yeah. 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 Which one's Finally your favourite? Thank you. I know, it's good to have that support. Yeah. And uh, why not show your support in the comments down below as you can share some of your examples of your favourite mounts that are not horses. They're so good. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit like and subscribe and also watch these other videos over here because there's oh, no, more. Oh, oh no! Ah, 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 it's taking my face! Ah, ah, it's taking my face!